Good morning. <coughs> the text today is Matthew 2, 1 to 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of carrying Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, where's the Messiah that was born? In Bethlehem, in Judah, they replied, for this is what the prophet has with, with, written. <clears throat> but you, Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are there no means least among the rulers of Judah? For out of you will come a ruler and who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report it to me so that I may go too and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. All right, so here we are, 2020, we made it, right? Yeah, this is a, a crazy new, new year already. Um, so we are doing uh, the, this is the season of Epiphany today. Tomorrow is technically Epiphany, but uh, because Sunday falls so close, we celebrate it as Epiphany Sunday. So we're doing a season of Epiphany, and uh, <laughs> uh, the idea that I'm coming up with for this series is this idea of gifts, these gifts that keep on giving. And doesn't it seem like, I don't know about you, but doesn't it seem like there tends to be a lot of potential for uh, conflict and confusion and even like bad surprises when it comes to participating in giving and receiving gifts? You ever had that? You know, like uh, there's stuff that comes with, there's a little baggage that comes with gift giving and receiving. Um, I don't know if it has something to do now with like all of the beautiful complexities of culture and maybe ethnicity or family uh, and society that we bring with us, but accepting gifts graciously can sometimes be a challenge, can it, right? I mean, you all know, you've been there, right? We just went through like some Christmas time and you probably, more than one of us in here maybe received a gift that you're like, oh, thanks. It's just uh, what I wanted, right? Yeah, you've been there. Now, now that we've kind of, we've had that commercialized, you know, gift giving season, it's now behind us. I want us to focus in on some of God's unexpected gifts that we can enjoy long after, you know, the Christmas tree's been taken down and hauled away. Uh, gifts that reveal themselves in new ways as time goes on. So that's what we're going to take a look at. In fact, this is a eight-week series. For the next eight weeks, Epiphany uh, happens for the next eight weeks. We're going to be working through some of the Gospel of Matthew and, and actually one week the Gospel of John. And we're going to take the opportunity to recognize um, the often surprising gifts that are extended to humanity by God. And they're, they're ours to receive if we are bold and loving enough to accept them. So January 6th, tomorrow, officially uh, ends the season of Christmas, right? Tomorrow, today is, the, is today the 12th day of Christmas or is tomorrow? No, it'd be today. Today is the 12th day of Christmas, right? So tomorrow officially ends January 6th, the season of Christmas. And during this season, the church celebrates, of course, the incarnation of Emmanuel, God with us. And we talked about that idea, what that means. Um, 
But if we're being honest, right, most of the Western world uh, and most of us uh, really in the church as well, not just the world, but we celebrate an excess of giving and receiving, right? How many, do you know the statistic, right, about um, people who go into debt for Christmas gifts usually don't end up paying off the debt until almost next Christmas, right? I mean, it just, that, that's kind of the statistic. It happens. And, and we, we sometimes... Uh, we sometimes just get wrapped up in this. And then although there's no biblical basis really to link Santa Claus or Secret Santa or white elephant gift exchanges to the season of Christmas, they do show up, right, in this first festival after Christmas gifts do on Epiphany. And this is when we celebrate. It's this festival of the revelation of Jesus and the text throughout the season will help us to understand Jesus' identity as the incarnate God, as God incarnate. It begins with this revelation of a great star that the Magi follow. It's, um, and it's really, these are the first people outside of Jesus' own family to kind of understand the importance of his birth. So I want to talk about just a couple of facts about the Magi, first of all, right? So how many Magi are there? Okay, all right. No, we don't know. That's the truth. We don't actually know how many they are. That's the truth, right? I know you've seen it in Christmas movies and in children's pageants and you've maybe read it in your favorite uh, Christmas retelling story, but we don't know actually how many there are. Now, we, the reason people say there's three is because three gifts are given, right? Frankincense, gold, and myrrh. So people just assume, well, there must be just three because there's no way these guys would travel this far and 12 of them only give three gifts, right? Or, you know, like maybe there could be that mindset where it's like, ah, yeah, there's 12 of us, but you know, uh, he and I went in on, together on the frankincense, right? That's from both of us, right? Uh, but we, so we don't actually know. We also, uh, I know that we picture Jesus in like a stable when the Magi arrived, but the truth is, in fact, even Matthew account says they were in a house when the Magi arrived. And in fact, we probably know that more than likely it was some time after Jesus's birth. In fact, maybe even up to two years after Jesus's birth that the Magi show up uh, to give gifts to this family, which makes sense then why Herod later, if you know the story, we didn't read into these verses, but Herod later has every child in the vicinity of Bethlehem, every male child within the vicinity of Bethlehem to and under uh, put to death because he's threatened by this coming of a new king. So <clears throat> the other times we call them, you hear me calling them magi over and over, but sometimes people call them what? Wise men, kings. That's right. Wise men are kings. And I've heard a joke that they couldn't have been that wise of men because of the gifts that they showed up with, right? I've heard that if it were three wise women, they'd have much more practical gifts, right? There'd be diapers and formula and things like that. That's the joke that I've heard, but I don't know. I don't know about this idea of practical gift giving or not, but these three people that we assume are three uh, did show up at some point after Jesus's birth and they brought these gifts and they were lavish gifts. They were gold and frankincense and myrrh. And this brings me to our idea of gift giving. How many of you are practical gift givers? Who in here is a practical gift giver? All right. So yeah, some of you. How many of you are like, no, mm -mm. practical gifts are fine for sometimes, but on Christmas we give, I don't know, we go over the top. So what was the most practical gift you gave this Christmas? Anyone want to share one? What was the most practical? Socks. Yeah, socks. Yeah, socks. That's right. That's great. And money. I got to tell you, I know socks seem very practical, but have you seen some people's socks these days? You know, some of the colors, and they're, they're, they're awesome. They're a lot of fun. They're a little whimsical, so not always right. Money, very, yeah, sure, but very practical. Uh, any other sensible, practical guess? Pillow, <laughs> pillow cases. Yeah, I got to admit, if you were giving me the gift on Christmas, I, that would be one I'd be like, oh, Thank you. I didn't even know I needed pillowcases, right? Yeah. Uh, I can remember, I actually remember a time 
when this, uh, I was just thinking about this on Christmas Day. My dad gave my mom a gift and she opened it up and it was a brand new iron, right? Yeah, what do you think my mom was? Uh, happy or not happy? <laughs> she was, she feigned it. She tried to feign a little happiness, but you know, she's like, oh yeah, yeah, I guess I did need a new iron. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> and uh, he said, no, oh, hang on, open it up. And she opened it up and inside was like some nice jewelry, you know, that he, he put inside the iron and iron box. There was also a new iron involved as well. But so my dad was both a practical and a, and a over the top kind of gift. But I don't know about you. I, sometimes, do you ever find yourself caught in this weird loop of gift giving where it's like, okay, so-and-so gave me a gift that was nice, but now I have to give a gift back that's either just as nice or <laughs> yeah, or better you ever get and so you give a, a better gift and then that person comes back with even better gift and, and then you just get in a spiral or it's like one uh our family sometimes gets stuck in this it's not necessarily gift giving but it's like the invitation thing right like okay so they invited us out to dinner so now we have to have them over for dinner, right? And we have to go all, all out. And then after you've had them over for dinner, then they like surprise you with, you know, like tickets to a, a concert or something like that. And you're like, oh, now we have to take them to, what's the next bigger thing? You ever been caught in that kind of, I mean, maybe not that extreme, but you ever been that? How come we have such a problem just receiving a gift? You ever... You ever have that? It's hard, isn't it, sometimes to receive a gift? And it's true, not all gifts are just freely given. For, for too many gifts, they come with some emotional or even expectational strings attached, maybe spoken or maybe even unspoken. Some gifts are given with the expectation of, you know, re reciprocation, right? Uh, others are given maybe to purchase forgiveness, right? Husbands, have we ever been in that situation before, right? Where, okay, maybe, it's, maybe I better come home with some flowers or something like that. I don't know. I've never been in that position. So, <laughs> so I wouldn't know. But sometimes these gifts are genuine expressions of one person's gratitude for the other person. And at other times, gift giving only continues to like perpetuate this idea that uh, you're there almost as a commodity. Our, f our relationship is a commodity. What can you do for me? I rub, uh, you know, I pat your back or I scratch your back, you scratch mine kind of thing. I think we've all experienced some type of gift giving awkwardness, whether it be uh, an inappropriate gift. You ever received an inappropriate gift before? And it's hard to explain why in the world that person gave me that gift or the obvious re-gift ever experienced one of those the ob like oh yeah oh that's right oh i've been in the middle of a situation where the re-gift was from a person and the person who gave the original gift was there you ever had that experience before that's fun and they're like wait a minute i didn't that's like the bread maker i got you oh Oh yeah, that's, that's right, that's right. Last Christmas, you did. I liked it so much. You know, you could tell they were lying. I liked it so much, I had to give one just like it to, to these people, right? Yep. Or um, maybe those times where there's like a huge difference in either like size or even significance of the gifts, right? I've had that happen. Uh, I'm being honest here. In our relationship between Lisa and I, I am much more the romantic gift giver. Lisa like was raised very practical. So for our 11th anniversary, I, uh, I planned this like surprise, you know, dinner and things like that. Lisa for our anniversary gave me the gift of an ear and nose hair trimmer, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I can really tell we've reached year 11 because <laughs> thank you very much. She's like, well, you always are asking me to, if I can pluck these hands. So I, I thought it was a great gift. I'm like, yes, 
It is, it's pretty nice. So anyway, we've all experienced some of that gift giving awkwardness before. Um, giving or receiving a gift when none is offered in return can be an awkward moment depending on the circumstances, but you know what? It can also be an occasion of deep sincerity and generosity and gratitude. And this is where the Magi come in. The Magi arrive at the home where Jesus and Mary are and they do not question whether Jesus needs these gifts. They don't comment on how humble uh, or, how ex- or even how exceptional his dwelling is. There's no comment on whether or not he deserves it or whether or not um, he's worthy of these gifts. In fact, Matthew never mentions the type of dwelling at all. They don't ask to see you know, his birth certificate or make sure he's deserving of these gifts in any way. They simply kneel before Jesus and they offer him their gifts and then they are indulgent gifts. You know, gold, like for a king. Myrrh, as to one who was mortal. And incense, as to a god. Those are the types of gifts you offer to in burning in worship. These gifts show that the Magi get Jesus. They understand who he is and who he will grow to be, so they honor him. The gifts brought by the Magi were completely unexpected by the household of Jesus. The gifts given were not self-centered in any way. They, were not, uh, they weren't obligated. There was no sense of obligation that they had to do this. In fact, they didn't even know this family in any way. And certainly they were not given out of guilt or the expectation of anything in return. No, these gifts were simply born out of a genuine realization of the reality of God, of Christ, an epiphany, of course. That's why we call it that. Gifts that are offered freely and out of a deep sense of joy, generosity, and gratitude are powerful gifts, both for the one who gives the gift and the one who receives. And I know that in our world today, we often have... um, we give in sometimes to cynicism and distrust that we become unable even to recognize and receive the offerings of others, right? Have you ever received a gift and it comes almost with a sense of why? Why are you giving me this gift? And then you don't know how quite to respond. The inability to receive gifts is, it is not just about material things either. I struggle with this when people offer um, affirmation You ever had that experience where like people say, you did such a good job at this and you're like, "Eh, I don't know what to do with that. Like I don't want to sound arrogant and be like, oh yeah, yeah, I did awesome, right? I did great on whatever it was. But at the same time, you don't want to demean the offering that they're giving to you by letting you know, hey, I thought what that, what you did was fantastic and you just don't, it's weird. It's like, I'm not quite sure how to do it. Uh, I had a friend who was a magnificent piano player, but mostly self-taught, you know? Some people can just do this, right? They can just sit down and they figure it out and they can go and they learn their instrument and they are amazing and that is a true gift. And I was listening to him play and I was just moved. You know, he was just messing around. It was, in, it, was, uh, it was in Bible College. It was Multnomah Bible College in Portland, Oregon. And it was this uh, kind of unused, not very often used chapel that was just off in one corner of the campus. And so he was in there playing, not really expecting anybody to be in there. But I think I was in there studying and I was just moved, you know, by his playing. And so I went, I, I thought, I'm going to go tell him, like, this is amazing, you're playing. And he was like, oh, no, no, it's no, it's not, I'm just messing around, it's nothing. And I was struck in that moment, like, I even, and I even said to him, Look, listen, I'm offering to you, like this, I was moved by this, this is fantastic, your playing was incredible. And listen, I'm, I'm saying this because I recognize that this is a gift, right? This is fantastic, you were given a gift by God. And why would you ever say, oh, it's nothing about a gift from God? And it like struck him like, oh yeah, I guess that's true. Thank you. I mean, that's all he could be left with. Like, thank you, thank you for sharing that with me. Gifts that are offered freely and out of a sense of 
Joy, generosity, and gratitude are powerful and they should be received. Um, not with a deflection, not with a denial of the gift that has just been given, but with just acceptance, accept. And I get it, we don't wanna become arrogant in our own assessment of ourselves, but at the same time, when someone gifts us with a gesture meant to acknowledge this holy, beautiful, and grace that we embody, we need to be able to simply receive it as offered. So my question for you is what keeps us from graciously accepting the unexpected gifts we are offered? What holds us back from offering a gift that is born out of joy, generosity, and gratitude? How can today's story of the Magi show us how to give and receive more faithfully? I want you to think on that this week. Giving out of a sense of joy, gratitude, and celebration, and receiving with a sense of grace and generosity. We all need to get better, <laughs> right, at giving and receiving gifts. No strings attached, right? And then I think born in us then is this idea of we can then be free to let those gifts flow through us to other people. Amen? Let's pray. God, I thank you for the example of these uh, magi who came from far off lands, offered their gifts, who recognized in Christ what exactly was going on. Sometimes we don't always get it, and sometimes we miss the point. But God, we are still a part of this fantastic story that's unfolding all around us. It is a gift to be here and to be a part of this story. We want to be people who give gifts, no strings attached, with generosity, gratitude, and joy. And we want to be people who recognize and receive the gifts with the same sense of joy and gratitude. No strings attached. Just this freedom to give and receive, recognizing the grace and the glory all around us. We love you, God, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.